So YouTube tells me that my videos are too long. That 60% of the people that watch my videos in the first 30, 40, 50 seconds of a video drop off. And by the time it gets to the end of the video, only 40% are still watching. So in response to that, they want me to make shorter videos. But I'm not making it, the videos for the 60% that drop off the first 30 seconds of the video. If you don't have an attention span that's greater than 30 seconds, then why are you even watching, right? I'm making these videos for the people that are at the end of the video. For those that watch the whole thing, those are the subscribers that I prepare content for. And in response to YouTube advising me to make shorts, I don't want to make shorts. I want to share my life. I want to share my stories. I want to show you stuff that I've done and, and places that I've been. I, I don't want to do shorts. I want to do a real video. My name is Peter Updike, and this is the Wild Treasures of an Outdoorsman YouTube channel. And, uh, yeah, welcome. And we're going to do a video tonight. I got something here I want to show you now. As many of you know, I own a welding shop. I build things with my hands, right? I craft things for people, and they pay me money. I've been doing it since 1982. I'm a craftsman. I'm a certified welder with the American Welding Society. I've done construction iron work. I've done agricultural work. I've done ornamental gates. I've done handrails. I've done aluminum welding. I've built tanks, and on and on and on and on and on it goes. But just recently, I built myself a belt buckle. Look at that. It's made out of stainless steel. It's some scrap stainless steel that a customer brought in. And it's got a little deer head in it. And the thing that I've discovered about us as humans is that we like to surround ourselves with the things that we love. I made a belt buckle because I wanted one. I don't have a belt buckle. I think I've got one that says Peter built on it or something, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, I made this belt buckle. Again, it's stainless steel. I cut the deer head out and put it on there he's a main frame i guess he's a i guess he's a 10 point you can't see his brow tines but i cut it all out with a plasma cutter and then uh colored it a little bit with a torch and then i ran a bead on top of a bead on top of a bead around the perimeter of the thing and on the back it's got the necessary attachment there and i got this belt like in 1985 at the lake county fair and it's been in my drawer and I'm in my closet and moved from place to place with me my entire adult life. It's got my name on the back of it. It says Peter, and it's got, how appropriate. It's got deer heads on it. So this is what I'm wearing to work these days. I put put down that other belt, and now I've got myself a, a really cool belt buckle that I made in the welding shop. Whoa, I like it. It's cool. So, um... That's that. I hope you have a belt buckle. I'm not going to make any for anybody. It took me four hours to make that one. I got way too much time in it. I'll never make any money doing it. But uh, <clears throat> something I wanted to share with you. Now, before we go any further, I want you to know that I am not a hocus pocus kind of guy. I am a... All right, this is the only time I'll mention it. All right, this is not a religious channel and i'm not promoting any type of faith here but i'm a christian i'm a born again washed in the blood full of faith christian man so what i'm about to tell you may seem contrary to that but i don't care okay whenever i find a piece of artifact in the woods or a piece of something from the past it always sets my mind to wonder and i and i challenge myself to find a way to discover the story behind it whether it be an arrowhead or a spear point or a rusty nail on the riverbank right or maybe a alligator tooth down the bottom of a spring who knows the stuff that you find buried under the earth it's been there for who knows how long but Arrowheads and spear points are the, the most common when I find one really set me off. And what I like to do is I, 
I kind of got this weird thing that I do, and I don't get, don't let me lose you now. This is kind of strange, and it's, and that, that blast of Halloween's coming up when all them ghosts and goblins are coming out. But uh, yeah, I find an arrowhead, and sometimes I hold on to that thing, and my mind goes to wonder, who was the person that made it, and uh, what was their life like, and what part of human history did they live, and uh, what connection did do I have with that person, whether they be male or female, who knows, right? Maybe several hunters, hunter for sure though, use that arrowhead, maybe that arrowhead or that spear point or that, that rock that's been chiseled and worked, that's got an edge, has been handed down from generation to generation to generation, and finally they lost it. And then along comes Peter and I find it laying there in the dirt. Holy smokes, look at that. And I've got some. I can show them to you. But I'd rather show you this. YouTube wants me to keep the segment short. But i got so much to say. So I hold that artifact in my hand. And then I kind of go into this little state of mind. And then I find a piece of paper and my pencil. And I draw the likeness of what I think the person looked like that had that artifact. Here's this picture. Look at that. Can you see that? I hope you can see that. I found a spear point, and uh, I held that spear point, and I got a little weird. I sat down there at my drawing table, and I draw the picture of the soul that hunted with that spear point. This is what he looked like. He's been dead for thousands and thousands and thousands. Of years. Now I've brought him back to life. Why? Because we share a connection. What's that connection? The connection of the hunting spirit, right? I got another one here for you. And this guy looks nothing like this guy. Check it out. Look at that guy. Can you see him? Now he's got this eagle carrying a snake and he's sitting there wondering. Wow, man, how's that bird fly like that, carry that snake? But, uh, yeah, I found a, I think I found a spear point and drew this guy. And this guy was the arrowhead. This, this guy kind of turned out like he might have been, you know, 1800s. But this guy, he dates back a lot further than that. Because when I, this guy's got a modern day clothing and shirt and modern day necklace on maybe yeah, he's a little bit more recent. But this guy here, he dates way back. Kind of cool, right? And then I found a I found an arrowhead one time and I drew a whole a whole community, right? A whole settlement, a whole 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 uh, place where they were living and and uh hunting and fishing and surviving life, right? How different it must have been for them. And man, it's just so intriguing. And then, and then I, I went ahead and I drew later on some settlers coming down the river. They're in a dugout canoe and uh, making their way, making a little discovery here and there. And uh, that's kind of cool with alligators on the bank. But uh, yeah, that's, that's just something I do. Here I drew a picture of the arrowhead as well. I don't know if you saw it or not. Yeah, it's really a spear point. It, it, it's very large and very dramatic and kind of cool i showed it in another video maybe you saw it but uh yeah we share a connection with other hunters and uh, the hunting story is probably the most underrated and not valued enough aspect to the hunt um i got a question i'm going to ask you i'm going to ask it at the end of the video and i'm going to ask you to comment on this question now I was hunting in the Withlacoochee State Forest. I was bow hunting in the Withlacoochee State Forest. Some time ago, I would say it was probably 10 years ago, and I was in a very familiar atmosphere, and I was in a very familiar place where I hunted a lot, and I knew where this trail was, and I knew how to get there in the dark, and I'd carry my tree stand and my deer buggy, same as I do today. My process is still the same. Processes and successful hunts and hunting stories are a window into how we can be successful. If I share my story with you or you share your story with me, I can gain information from your story that's going to help me. And this is this is how it works. So, yeah, I, I, I had it. I, I'm still hunting the same way today as I did 15 years ago. Anyway, uh, I made my way down a trail with my deer buggy, went as far as I could as my 
way I do, and then I took my tree stand off my deer buggy, and I lugged it with my backpack and my bow to a designated tree I knew would work that overlooked a very active trail. Now, there were some rubs up and down that trail. There were no scrapes because it was a very wet atmosphere. It was in a cabbage palm swamp very close to the Withlacoochee River. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I made my way up into a tree. It was early archery season. It was hot. I was sweating from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And uh, it was kind of miserable. And I often wondered why I was even out there at all. But there I was. I guess I was out there because hunting season had come. Anyway, uh, I sat there for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And it was probably 8.30, 9 o'clock when I heard a little something behind me and here come this doe trotting down the trail that I was overlooking. Now the tree that I was on was right next to the trail. It was it was like three yards from the trail. Now I could see other areas around there, but uh, <clears throat> the trail was the big, big key and really most of the cypress trees in there, the bases of those cypress trees, they're so big you can't hardly get a climb and stand around those bases and by the time you get very high, the tree has now shrunk down it's always a difficult tree to get on, but uh, I was on one nonetheless and overlooked that trail, and there I was sitting there when a doe came trotting by. Anyway, uh, five minutes went by, and she came in from behind me, and I heard him before I saw him. He was coming down that trail, and I could hear him grunting, every step, grunt, 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 and uh, I grabbed my bow, and I already had an arrow knocked. I just had it hung there on the stand and uh, came to full draw. And along came a nice buck with a very recognizable rack. He had little points on one side and a normal rack on the other. And uh, I think he's an eight point or something. Anyway, he wasn't a tremendously large deer, but he was a, a good legal buck. Okay. And uh, he came trotting by me. I came to full draw and I tried to stop him by grunting at him. And he would have nothing to do with that. And uh, I thought I was on the deer and... I, I, as far as I know, I was pretty close and uh, thought it was a good idea to let an arrow go. He was only three yards away. I was looking straight down on him, and I watched that arrow go. It really didn't go over his back because I was shooting straight down and actually went behind him, right? It, over his back would imply this, but really it was just, it was over his back because I was over here, but the arrow went down through that way and came close to him, but not close enough, and and I missed that deer, and the deer ran down that trail, none the wiser how close he came to death. Three or four inches inward would have been a perfect spinal shot, right? That deer ran off. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but I work really hard to be successful. I try, and I make a real effort, you know, and, and when failure finds us, it hurts. It hurts something fierce. And it's something sometimes we have to get over, right? But uh, in time, we always do get over it, and hopefully we learn a little something from it. I got down from my ladder stand, from my climbing stand, and found my arrow, and I was kind of disgusted, and I thought, well, I, just, I should just go home. And uh, proceeded to put the arrow back into the quiver and toyed with the idea of taking loose my stand and putting it on my buggy and going, I was, yeah, it's too hot. I don't need this. I've missed. That was the show. The show was over. I'm going to go home. And then a little something came to me and just said, you know what? If you go home now, this is what I always say about executing a hunt. If I decided to hunt to one o'clock, that's a decision I made prior. It is now quarter till nine, right? And I made the decision to hunt to one o'clock and I made the effort to get there, made the drive to go, right? I'm, I'm hurt. I'm disgusted and I'm mad. I hunted how many hunts? Who knows? How many hours? Who knows? I've lost track. Years, seasons have gone by and I've not killed a deer with my bow. And uh, this buck came trotting right by me and shot and I missed. But something just spoke to my heart and said, you know what? You should get it in your stand and you should hunt till one o'clock because that's what you had planned on doing. You execute a complete hunt. That's how you're successful. I said, yeah, maybe five years from now when another one decides to come by, right? No. I got back in that stand, and 30 minutes later, I looked down that trail, 
here comes our friend, the eight-point book that just ran by. Now, again, I recognized his rack. I said, oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. He's coming back. And I grabbed my bow, and he walked right on by, and I put an arrow right through his rib cage, straight down, and he came out. And he ran off down through that swamp like a bolt of lightning. And I couldn't believe how he ran. And uh, and my, my first impression was I'm never going to find that deer. And, uh, and, and in truth, um, I may have never blood trailed such an extensive blood trail in my hunting career. That might be the longest blood trail that I've ever followed. And uh, you can't see nothing in there. It's just palm meadows. Wall to wall, head high, tall palmettos. And uh, I had a, a roll of paper towel and some toilet paper. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to walk down through here. I'm going to find blood. And I'm just going to put a piece of paper towel. And, of course, they always tell you to wait. So I took all my gear down off the tree. And I took my tree stand back to my buggy. And I carried it back to the truck. And I put the tree stand in the truck, locked it up, got the buggy, and went back to the tree and knew that I'd have to drag that deer if I found it back to the tr back to the buggy and then the buggy onto the truck again my process has never changed so I began following that blood trail and it was an awesome blood trail very easy to follow he that deer ran a good hundred yards down through that swamp and everywhere I found good blood I just lay a piece of toilet paper on the ground I noticed that that deer was running on a trail, that the deer had gathered his wherewithal, was making its way down through the cabbage palm swamp towards the river. And I just kept on going and dropping paper towel. Now I say a paper towel, I put like a, like a two by two square, and I put it on the ground so I could make my way back out of there, shortest distance back to the, so I don't want to drag it too far, right? Anyway, uh, by myself, I went down through there and I, and I walked and I walked and I, found blood more blood more blood and it was it was an awesome experience following a blood trail that was very encouraging uh that that thunder i guess it was a thunderhead 125 grain thunderhead had done its job and that deer was piled up in some palm fronds when i found it when i found it it surprised me because i was just standing there contemplating my next direction when i looked to my left and boom there he was I, holy smokes that scared me you know but here's that deer See, there's the rack. That's how, how you can tell. Look at them little tines. He got just little bitty tines coming off of there. And he's got a little bitty, little bitty brow tine there. And then he's got this right here. But this is, this is a young deer, but he's certainly legal. And I was dang proud to have him and appreciated killing that deer. But I learned a valuable lesson that day. That if I had planned to hunt till 1 o'clock and if I had gotten discouraged and giving up and going home if i had denied my hunting ancestors you know the wherewithal to keep hunting what am i gonna do i'm gonna go home and mow the grass no i plan to hunt to one o'clock so that's exactly what i was gonna do i was gonna hunt to one o'clock and uh, it paid off big time for me so i appreciate all of you that are still here we're at about 18 minutes so that's a pretty long video for youtube i appreciate all the subscribers now i want you to comment below i want you to tell me whether or not a deer has ever given you a second chance how many second chances have you ever had i can i can count four second chances but they've all come with rifles where i missed the deer and that deer shouldn't have hung around i shot at him again i think i did i did uh three deer i i got a second chance at a buck in the rock springs wildlife management area that I never did find, and uh, that's in that video, The Rock Springs. That was a second chance, but because the first shot, I missed him. The second one, I hit him, and I never recovered that deer. And uh, two others with rifle that I did recover, they they gave me a second chance, and they should have done that. And then this deer. So that's, that's four second chances. How awesome is that? All right, so... Uh, Coming a little slideshow, I'm going to show you the pictures that I drew on the slideshow here. Comment below and let me know how many second chances you've had. Tell me the story. I read all the comments, and I will always promise to read the comments and to reply. Yeah, the 40%, that's why I'm here. Love you guys. See you. Bye.